Well, this is the first in our series of a Physician to Physician podcast, and we would uh, like to start by welcoming Dr. Jan de Prest, who's Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology at uh, University of Leuven in Leuven, Belgium. Uh, Jan, welcome today. I'm uh, Kenneth Moise. I'm the director of the Comprehensive Fetal Care Center here at Dell Children's in Austin, Texas. And Michael? And I'm Michael Bevington. I'm the co-director of the Comprehensive Fetal Care Center here in Austin, Texas. So, Dr. DePress, welcome. Uh, Thank you. Appreciate Thanks you coming to me. Texas. Uh, just a little background, maybe. Uh, you're trained as a urogynecologist. You're still practicing urogynecologist. How did you go from urogynecology into fetal surgery? Uh, well, to, to be honest, it's also the only reason why I'm here now. It's because the World Urogyne Conference is now here hosted. Um, but um, in, at the beginning, when I was academically appointed, um, I had to choose a specialty that was viable. And in our unit, the uh, urogyne unit was the one where you could grow in. It was the beginning of laparoscopy. And uh, so you had a tremendous boost of surgical procedures done by laparoscopy. And at that time, my mentor, he was Ivo Brosens. He's, uh, an he was very famous for discoveries on the placenta and, and hypertension. So he was very visionary. He said, there is something that you could try to do by endoscopy. And that was because in Paris, they just had done a few diaphragmatic hernia repairs by open surgery, and that didn't end up well. And so he said, that might be a nice thing to explore. And that became my PhD research project. Okay. I got teamed up with the pediatric surgeon, another Belgian now at Brown University, here the head of pediatric surgery, Francois Lux. And that's how it started, developing animal models, developing techniques, and then to translate into the first in man procedure or in woman procedures, and the rest is history. Wow. And you still practice in the urogynecology? Yes, world. but that is for another reason. That's the bread and butter for to it pay my salary because all the rest is, of course, uh, not. I mean, it's insufficient. Of course, it's not a viable program in the way with us the health system functions. It's a fee for service, and it's delivery is bringing more than any complex procedure. And the same for urogynecology. It's high volume. I see. I see. Well, you came up with this idea of tracheal occlusion. You said open surgery did not work well for diaphragm hernia. You referred to that. How did you come up with this idea of putting a balloon in the trachea to treat diaphragm hernia? Well, I mean, to be honest, that idea was actually old. Already in the 40s, uh, there were experiments that showed that if you ligate the esophagus, for instance, it gives a trigger for growth of the gut. And um, then there was work done I think it is uh, originated from uh, Boston, Jay Wilson, our pediatric surgical colleague. I mean, proposed that as an experimental approach, and they did it in uh, small animal models, mm -hmm. showing that tying the trachea uh, was promoting lung growth. And um, so from that, we were aware of that. We went to the meetings where I met you first. So um, where that this was, a way that we could perhaps use video endoscopy mm -hmm. to use to deliver a device that was endoluminal rather than extraluminal, and if it was a device that would be visible on imaging, it would be reversible. And I think for five years, so many teams try to develop complex and less complex techniques, and this technique is the most simple one, and that's the one that got translated. But the occlusion idea is definitely not, uh, we are not to be credited, but I think for the introduction of the endoscopic modification and then trying it out, um, well, we certainly contributed to this. So I believe Harrison was doing external clipping to occlude the trachea, but you came up with an idea of doing it with a scope and doing it intraluminal. And how did you pick the balloon, the particular balloon that you used? Well, uh, this is already the third balloon that is now okay. clinically used, and the bad news is in two years it will not be possible oh. to use that anymore unless the European Union approves it for uh, further use in, in clinical medicine. So the first balloon was a, an Australian one, then we moved to a, a US-based one in silicone, 
and actually the one we use now is, is a very old vascular occlusion balloon that is still for sale in parts of the world where they cannot afford coils for, uh, for vascular occlusion. So that, that balloon is, uh, uh, was as fortunately the size of what we needed. I see. So we tried to find to match the, di the, tr uh, the tracheal diameter and the length of that balloon okay. so that it would fit a, a trachea, a human trachea, and that is how we ended up with this. I see. So part of the prerequisites was to develop a way to measure lungs to decide who needed this therapy, and you developed, an, well, I guess the LHR had been around for a while, but you did some work to look at maybe modifying that to correct for gestational age. Tell us about that. Yeah. So again here, the story started in California where they initially proposed indeed the lung to head ratio. Mm -hmm. And that was very logic. I mean, you have a small lung on a normal head. So a small lung to head ratio would predict a poor outcome because that's really what the condition is, small lungs. Um, at that stage, the window that they were looking at was like two to four weeks. I mean, between 22 and 26 weeks. So the gestational age at which the measurements were done were all on the same time. Right. But as we know for so many other biological processes, I mean, things are changing over gestation because the lungs and the head do not grow at the same pace, so you have to correct for it. I see. And that's where the observed over expected lung to head ratio comes from. You have your index case, you measure your lung to head ratio, and you look into a book or you use an app to know what it should be in a normal uh, baby and then you ex explain it by a percentage of the normal and everybody understands that and 25% was a cutoff that correlated with a survival rate of around 15 to 20%. I see. And then there were some modifications. I think the original one looked at the two axis and you showed that tracing it seemed to work better. Yeah, yeah so also again logic because in for many other measurements Standardization is the first thing you do, and indeed you can measure a surface in many ways, and certainly when it's difficult, we have a very irregular shape, and that's where it came from that, uh, by comparison, you could show that tracing is the most reliable, reproducible way to do this, and uh, that was, was used in the trial, and is still in use in many centers. Huh? Right. So. This is a simple measurement with ultrasound at the four chamber view of the heart. Lots of people do MRIs and look at lots of lung volumes and total lung capacities and percent diaphragm or liver herniation of diaphragm. Is there still a role for MRI to help predict that severe case? Well, from a theoretical perspective, it is definitely so because you try to measure your lung development to begin with, the lung to head ratio measures one lung. The biggest one, that's probably the most predicting one. But so we'd, we could measure it in 2D as well, the, the two lungs. But of course, if you're going to stack measurements on each other, you will have a volumetric uh, assessment. And we can all imagine that you have tiny lungs that are long or something that is very big, but that is so short that this is smaller than the other thing. So, but usually in real life, that doesn't matter that much. So we have heavily invested it in 3D volumetry, mm -hmm. both by ultrasound, which would be accessible for everybody. MRI, which in Europe is quite expensive and there is shortage of having slots. So um, we explored both I and mean, showed that in ultrasound, it wasn't possible to measure the smallest lung and then we had MRI, but we could not demonstrate that it was better predictive. Nice. So for a prediction model, yeah, you really need relatively big data, standardization of measurement. I mean, we all think that an MRI machine spits out automatically a measurement that is accurate. No, no, there is still human interference. And the number of slices that are taken through a 26 weeks long, you, I mean, it's not like 10, I mean, it's three or four. So it is difficult to show that it is better, but theoretically, we're still not giving it up. But in practice, there's nothing wrong with measuring it in 2D with ultrasound because it has worked and it still works. Still works today. Does the same apply to MRI for looking at the amount of liver herniation? Um, 
again, that's here the same when you look at the amount of liver herniation. There has been also a lot of standardization work. So there's at least three methods that I'm aware of, of measuring it. But uh, it is, of course, then m converting a yes-no question, a binary, into a continuous variable. And by definition, this should work better. The question is then, is that independently influencing the process? I, to my knowledge, this is not perfectly sorted out. But in our most recent analysis of the data that we have, that liver and lung are sometimes independent from each other. So I think it is wise still to measure these two features. In France, they have then also looked at, can we not measure something else that is easier, like stomach herniation? Mm -hmm. Because that seems to be an indirect measure of liver uh, herniation. So all of this is not sorted out, but that's why we keep on collecting data. In Europe, we have standardized the measurements. We have now an agreement how we do it, and that will give us data that will tell us what we should measure and what we can actually forget measuring and then see what the best prediction model is. So you believe the stomach location is a surrogate for the amount of liver herniation? Uh, at least in four out of uh, five cases. And uh, yeah, then the question is, where, where would you really win in the prediction? Is that the last 20%? I can't tell you until we have uh, enough data to, to say. So I don't want to claim that one is better than the other if we don't really know. And of course, the stomach is a, again, where do you measure the stomach? What, what part of the stomach would you use to decide where it's located? Yeah. So. They were again very practical when they proposed this method. They said, let's, let's do it in the same plane where we already do our measure and a four chamber view, which we all know and where there are rules for and that people can really measure in the proper way. Um, the position of the fetus is then another confounder. But anyway, so in that plane, the position of the stomach in relation to the AV valves is giving you a four step system and that is correlated to a certain degree of liver herniation. I see, I see. So let's get to the meat of the matter. You are the uh, primary author on two very important papers from the New England Journal of Medicine, one on moderate disease and one on severe disease. Could you summarize sort of the entry criteria and the findings of those two papers? So first of all, we agreed on what is severe and moderate. And that was based on observational data, including some uh, American uh, numbers. And um, we categorized this empirically 25%, whatever the position of the liver was called severe. Okay. And the treatment that we already studied before was insertion of the balloon. And that balloon was inserted then typically at 25 at the earliest, up to 30 weeks, depending on when the cases were diagnosed. And those data were used to do a power calculation. So the procedure was 27 to 30 weeks. And that was already a bit later because we said the earlier you go, the more prematurity you cause, logically. Yeah. Then there was this moderate group, which, which is a bit of a misnomer because the predicted survival rate was around 55% in that population. And that was 25 to 35% of the normal, irrespective of the liver. And then the first category of 35 to 45, where the liver had to be up. Okay. Was this the wisest decision? That was based on the data we had. Of course, there you have a background survival rate that is relatively high. So when you would consider a fetal intervention, you should be sure that you don't compromise on that background survival. So the rationale was, let's try to avoid prematurity. I see. And the easiest trick to avoid prematurity is do your intervention later. Mm -hmm. That may come at a price, but that was felt that was, was appropriate. The biggest problem was there, we had no data on how good would tracheal occlusion work we claimed, based on our earlier data, that the response was dependent on the lung size. We didn't, we didn't really know. So the trial was very complex. What it was done is you do a first batch randomized and you look at the outcomes of tracheal occlusion in that group. And that is then used to calculate the final sample size. Having said that, we had a multiple look trial 
which of course increased in the numbers and that's why we are waiting so long to sit here <laughs> to know about the outcomes. So um, that is how they were designed. So severe early occlusion, moderate late occlusion and the cutoff is 25% uh, for severe to the left and 25 to 45 taking the liver into account is moderate. And severe was the endpoint was survival, correct? No, the so in both trials, the, it is survival to discharge. Okay. In the moderate group, which was like designed a little bit later, we already learned from the early criticism that they say, I mean, but this is not about survival only, it's a morbidity okay. that you need to take into account. And we have no other data than oxygen dependence. And so we said, not short term, but we will look at oxygen dependency at six months of age, which is a reasonable early morbidity indicator. It's not what parents probably would say, but we had no idea what the relationship with prenatal measurements was and, for instance, feeding at two years. So that is how it was designed. So both have this survival to discharge um, from the neonatal intensive care unit and then a co-primary or a secondary endpoint that was more and more morbidity driven. I see. So what did the trial show? So um, for severe hypoplasia, actually what we predicted happened. Okay. The survival rate was about 2.6 times higher with fetal treatment. That was the primary endpoint. Quite convincing uh, confidence intervals. A relatively low numbers in the trial. So the, this trial was stopped early because of efficacy. And that was actually only weeks later uh, than the other trial, purely by coincidence. But so that trial uh, was stopped with very convincing results. The other trial was then analyzed and required all the five uh, steps. And we, so we had recruitment of the full cohort <clears throat> and uh, that trial always apparently in retrospect flirted with uh, significance and since I use the word flirting you know <laughs> what that means. Uh, so this confidence interval, so that trial showed a 13% difference in survival and that was uh, the confidence interval went from 0.99 to uh, 1.67 I believe and um, yeah that's the most annoying result that you can have and um, but that's it I mean you can only report secondary endpoints uh, were we were not powered for that so we, we had no way to clinically translate that differently than reporting that and that's what uh, in all fairness was done and uh, we were glad that they were published back to back because at least the people were immediately informed of this dilemma and uh, we were glad that they were reported in that journal because I think they really helped us wording what exactly was found. And uh, that's where we were then about six, seven months ago. So after that, <clears throat> there was a meta-analysis done, which you helped co-author, where you put the two trials <clears throat> together. So explain to us why you put the two trials together. So let me first explain you that this is a, a way to try to understand these apparently contradicting findings. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, at first glance, it contradicts it. I mean, something that would increase survival by a factor 2.7, and then something that would not have any effect. What we said is um, there are a few things that can be looked at as a continuum rather as a binary variable. First of all, that's severity. I mean, lung hypoplasia is a continuing variable. It goes from 15% to 45% by definition. Okay. The second thing is, these were not two similar treatments. One group had a treatment, tracheal occlusion, yes, but much shorter, mm -hmm. because in all cases, the balloons were removed at 34 weeks, which is based on the animal experimental data and clinical data that said, if you reverse, you have better outcomes. And we decided to re revert at 34 weeks based on those data. But that means that you have also occlusion period, if you want, as a continuum. Mm 
And uh, we, we had a statistician on board uh, in, in this trial who was really, uh, I mean, this guy who had nothing to do with the medical problem. Uh, actually, the first statistician died, so he had to take over in the middle of that trial. And he brought a fresh idea at the end, after everything was accepted and published. He said, but, you know, uh, he makes prediction models. He says, you should look at your data now in a different way. Okay. And what he proposed is you pool the observations and you use, of course, these are two separate populations, but you actually look at the treatment effect of occlusion and how it is dependent on the duration of occlusion, so the time point you put it in, right. as well as the severity, but let these continuous variables do their work. Okay. And that gives you a perfect curve, of course, of real observations. Half of the patients who were not treated before birth, you have their lung-to-head ratios, and you get a survival plot, which is surprisingly exactly the same as it was before the trial in that prediction model. And then you have observations that, that are real in the severe group, under 25%, and then in the moderate group that are from 25 to 45%, but then by pooling, they can calculate the treatment effect in the patients who were having a severe a hypoplasia who were not treated late or moderate patients who did not have an early occlusion. Okay. And so from that, the computer models the theoretical treatment effect if you would put in the balloon earlier or if you would have a bigger or a smaller lung. And that analysis says when you look at these data that the treatment effect is significant all over. For, everything. For both groups. For both groups, but the treatment effect being smaller for the moderate group, logically, but the earlier you would insert the balloon, the bigger the treatment effect. At the same time, the bigger the if side effect as well. Prematurity is purely dependent. When are you going to rupture your membranes and deliver is dependent on when you put in the balloon. For every week, for every seven days you put in the balloon earlier, you will lose four days of gestation on average. Can you predict that? No. So putting this combined data together, are you suggesting that a patient with a, say, 28% ODE ratio, liver up, might have a balloon placed a little bit earlier than what we had originally thought? So that is our, our interpretation within the PIs of this uh, trial and certainly the ones that are in Europe. Um, clinically translated, is they say, if we want to have a stronger treatment effect, we must put in the balloon earlier in that moderate group. That is what we offer to patients. You could, of course, argue, could you do that again in a new trial? Mm -hmm. I don't think we can do a new trial for, for many reasons, even if we would want to. But um, there is a, an alternative method for that, is that if you now create a new cohort of patients that are systematically assessed in the same way, mm -hmm. having their redoubts in the same way, and you prospectively register them, it's the second best solution for creating new knowledge on this group, having an occlusion earlier. And that is what we do now in Europe. And uh, we hope to create data, sufficient data, to either uh, see that this was not true or whether it would be true. And um, that's how we work now. I mean, it's certainly open to criticism, but most of us felt that it would not be possible to do a trial already given with all the problems we had to to the initial so, trial. So this would be more of a registry of prospectively yes. collecting the data. Yeah. And in a way, there is literature uh, around that. Whether this is the best method is one thing. I mean, we don't claim that. But it's the second best for things that are difficult to do within a trial, for instance, in rare diseases. Um, but everybody, of course, has to adhere then to what the rules of a registry are. And, and yeah, we cannot control that perfect, but at least the, uh, the PIs from this total trial are no in agreement
that they, if they do this, they will have to do it in this way with prospective registration. So when would you be putting it in the moderate group? Now? We now uh, um, offer the patients to have their occlusion between 27 and, and 29 completed weeks. Okay. And uh, it is more a logistic, it's not really if it's a little bit bigger or long, no, we just move to the left and accept the, the side effect it will have on premature rupture. And so that would apply to anyone in the moderate group? Um, it's an interesting question whether you can actually dissect out, if you look at the 25 to 45, you have really three steps, 25 to 35, liver up, then liver down, and then the group that has 35 to 45 with liver up, yes, there is a trend there. You can, you can actually see there is a trend, but to find a good cutoff there, we, we, we didn't look at that and, and, and at this moment we just want to keep exact the same management, but just move it to the left. It's open for discussion, I mean, for sure. sure. Because we're, <clears throat> with any intervention, we're always balancing risks and benefits. And from what you've been saying, the larger the ODE LHR, the less treatment effect. And yet there's still comparable risks in terms of prematurity. I may have misexpressed it. So the shorter the duration of occlusion, the less treatment effect. So that is why we prolong the occlusion. Of course, the background survival rate is um, higher in this group. But what our pool data did also show is that it's not really dependent on the LHR, it's the duration of occlusion that plays the most important role. We were initially convinced of the opposite. Huh? And, uh, and, and there is, in that paper that describes this, there is also the, when you look back, actually the data that we had showed that the duration of occlusion was the most important predictor of way again in lung size whether you do it by volumes, etc. So that is, um, I think that's the most important factor. So that's why we go earlier. But the earlier you go, the greater the risk. The earlier, not the, the earlier you're going to have a delivery. Yeah? That's not, the, the risks remain the same. But of course, the end result is that the patient may deliver it much earlier with all the consequences of that. Huh? Right. So are there any discussions about moving the severe even earlier to get an even greater treatment effect in the severe group? Uh, the reason why we didn't consider that is because we think that the risks for that on the trachea are, uh, that, that is, at, in the early days, we have gone as early as 24, and the patients that had very early occlusions are overrepresented in the tracheal problems. And we kind of abandoned that, and, uh, but, but I don't know whether this is really hard data um, but when you go earlier, you, you have these consequences on the trachea and we don't want to know, change all the variables at the same time. But it is theoretically certainly worthwhile. Huh? So one of the other questions <clears throat> is the treatment after birth and the variation that takes place from, you know, country to country, center to center, particularly in relation to the use of ECMO which is used much more uh, widely in North America than it would be in Europe. And what would be the influence of postnatal treatment on the outcome if it's survival to discharge and you know, oxygen requirements at two years of age? Oh, we have acknowledged that at the time of publication that this trial has many shortcomings and one of them is obviously that, I mean, it was standardized neonatal management, but standardization in this field is not that standardized as you would want it to be. Certainly when there are options on ventilation strategies or the use of ECMO. So um, first of all, there were patients that were treated at ECMO centers. I mean, that was not, but there are centers who do not strongly believe in ECMO. And I just would like to point out, I mean, nobody really knows whether ECMO has a proven role in this. I mean, I know this is in 
several places that this is a strategy and that they have booked good results, but we don't have the same level of evidence on that. But it's true so that in most of the centers, the use of ECMO was much lower than what you would hear uh, here in typical numbers in, in Northern America, but also, I mean, in, in Germany, the, there is a center with a high ECMO rate and with very good outcomes. Um, unfortunately, our trial does not allow to look at that as a variable. We, so we have, it was not stratified by treatment center, neither prenatally and definitely not postnatally. So yes, these babies were managed postnatally at a multitude of hospitals, but with a standardized protocol. If you really want to control that, this will need to be a single center trial. I mean, you can try that with diaphragmatic hernia. I think uh, we're going to be long time forgotten by the time we will know that answer. Plus, there, there has been considerable evolution in the neonatal management of babies with, with uh, CDH, <clears throat> just in terms of changes in ventilation strategies. Um, so we're, we're, we're in an ever-shifting background. It's a moving of, target, that's sure. But when you really honestly look at the change in survival rates in the CDH study group registry, it's a global registry. If you look at 25 years survival rate, they have gained around 4% survival rate in that registry over 25 years. I don't know whether that is clinically so different. I mean, all these revolutions in neonatal strategies or no prenatal strategies, I don't know whether they are really always that much of a revolution and the data are not there to support. I mean, the ventilation strategies in Europe, they did a randomized trial on two different ventilation strategies, no difference in survival. I mean, many of these things may have less impact than we would think. I mean, they may in a single center have had a big impact, but it's not necessarily in the real world when you go to more centers. But again, I, we accept all these limitations. Eh? But I guess the other, you know, the other thing is, is in adopting an occlusion strategy, um, you know, should we be looking at some sort of standardization or some sort of, of uh, ability to uh, regulate or control the quality of that procedure? Um, well, you're probably talking to the, to the wrong person. I mean, of course, I, I think like for any postnatal management, I mean, also that should be centralized, standardized. The fetal medicine community now has to decide how they implement that. We, I, we can only say that for this trial, it was recommended that one, you are com familiar with the prenatal assessment of a patient with diaphragmatic hernia, which assumes that you have a certain turnover and expertise because that's the, the case selection. Number two, that you had to have a fetoscopy program so that there is a team that is familiar with the instruments, the techniques, and we said that was empirically decided, 36 procedures per year, so that, that you don't do this as an occasional thing. And then number three, that you have to have 15 procedures prior to your first enrollment. Also, that was empirically decided, but these are already the conditions that I would definitely recommend to a center starting such, a, I mean, and then that you can keep a certain volume and uh, yeah, for the rest, we can only hope that people will adhere to that and they will have to make their decisions whether they meet these criteria or they can demonstrate that this gives them the ability to do this. The removal of the balloon for me is the most important bottleneck in the program where this treatment can be lethal eh, for the baby. And that is, if you can't remove that balloon 24-7, it should be a limiting factor before you go into that. The nightmare is if we're going to resolve this, and we're probably going to resolve it with this new type of balloon that we're investigating, then really the only limitation is the insertion of a balloon, which is not the most difficult procedure. 
you have in fetal medicine. You've done more difficult transfusions in early gestational babies. So I, I think we will have to self-control because you, you can not come up with numbers and cutoffs, I mean, that are really validated. Huh? So can you describe what's coming in terms of new balloon mm -hmm. design? Well, there is a phase one trial only in Europe. This is a European device. Uh, it was invented in Strasbourg. And what they did is they, rather than the latex valve that is there, it is a metallic magnetic valve, a metallic cylinder with a magnetic ball. And uh, so when you bring that balloon any close to a, a strong magnet, like a fetal, uh, like an MRI machine, then this balloon opens, the valve opens and the balloon deflates and finds its way to the gut or to the amniotic fluid. So um, that was, again, as typical, first evaluated in animals. We looked whether it had no more tracheal side effects. We then looked whether it was occlusive. Then we looked whether it had the same effect on lamps with diaphragmatic hernia and, and it just did everything that it had to do in terms of treatment effect. But what was more important is, can you in those lamps demonstrate that the balloon is always coming free when you're exposed to uh, an MRI? And that was confirmed as well. We also did in silico model. So we now know what strength you need to uh, deflate the balloon. The phase one trial now is a very difficult trial in this respect is you, the trial is designed to show a zero failure rate. That's a very difficult thing to do. I mean, in, in space uh, travel, they know what that is. But uh, so in a way we have uh, twice 23 patients, 23 in, in Belgium and 23 in France that will be uh, participating in this trial. And um, we hope that we will have a 100% deflation rate and so far so it is good. I mean, the only endpoint is, is the balloon spontaneously coming out of the trachea? Open airways and migration to a safe part. So do you wheelchair them around the MRI magnet? <clears throat> so uh, the good news is it, whether you put them on a stretcher, in a wheelchair, whether you stand up, whether the baby is transverse, vertex or bridge, it always ma works. And it even works in a lamp walking with its mother around the MRI machine. Interesting. You can't put the patient anymore in an MRI machine as long as the occlusion is there. Eh? Sure, right. So that's maybe another limitation, but I think for obstetrical decisions, we don't really need that much MRI, isn't it? Or there'll be some other device that you'll <clears throat> wave at the pregnant abdomen that will transmit that level of uh, well, fortunately, the French field that is, is required it needs to be at least 1.5 Tesla and not a single magnetron or anything will cause unintentional deflation. Mm. There's other things to come as a, I think the most important development will be is how can we tweak the effect of tracheal occlusion? And so we are working on transplacental drug administration. We're working on um, the addition of things under the occlusion, um, extracellular vesicles is now what we will explore. I mean, there's very good work from Toronto that has shown that it works in all animal models except for sheep. So that needs to come. And that is something that would be easily an add on, the same as uh, antihypertensive drugs that could remodel uh, the pulmonary vasculature. But all of this is research that does not necessarily will show that it works or tweaks the outcomes. Huh? So do you foresee, I mean, the, the balloon occlusion certainly promotes lung growth, but does that then translate into decreased problems with pulmonary hypertension? Um, that the data are conflicting. Um, there is data from here in the United States, from Houston, uh, that they think that they see a lower than expected pulmonary hypertension rate. In the European data, in the initial, uh, I think around 200 occlusions, there was an effect, but it wasn't a very strong effect. And um, I'm not 100% sure that the current strategy solves the problem of pulmonary hypertension. Certainly it doesn't solve it in, every, in, in everybody, and that's why 
it is wise to think about additional strategies that target that particular problem more. And you did some work, I think, in a rabbit model with sildenafil. Yes. Is there uh, any future to that? Um, unfortunately not, because sildenafil, uh, we, we were even at the level of a phase one trial. So sildenafil, when you administer it to, to rabbits and, and, and rats indeed, uh, changes the pulmonary vasculature, both functionally, flow, histology. Um, it cannot be tried out in lambs because the placenta is different and we had to stop our trial on the extent model which would be because then you can give it directly to the fetus. But we went to humans and we were stopped after four or five patients because of the observations in trials that were looking at growth restriction or other obstetrical indications, I mean amniotic fluid, volume, etc. And uh, there was an, uh, in Holland only, uh, the impression that there was more pulmonary hypertension mm -hmm. if you give sildenafil, and different explanations were for that. This was not confirmed in other countries in the Strider trial, and we probably will never know, because we were stopped by the regulator. They said, this, we will not want you to give any sildenafil to human beings anymore in pregnancy for that reason. We had predicted that this would happen because if you give a drug to change the pulmonary vasculature, but your vasculature is normal, right. it's logic that this becomes abnormal and it may become functional. We said this, uh, don't throw the child with the bathwater. We say, we know to whom we will give it. That is the patient with um, pulmonary, that is a good candidate for pulmonary hypertension. But I, I think we will not go back. So we know we're looking at triprostinol, uh, where I think we will have the same effects, but we may have a second chance. So the answers are still to be uh, to be written. Yeah, but um, like so many things in fetal medicine, it's a never-ending story. And certainly when then also postnatal therapy keeps on changing. I sure. mean, of course it will change. What is for sure is that the treatment effects are not good enough to serve the entire population at this stage. So back to the drawing board for that. Good. Thank you very much. Yeah, Jan, it's you. been a pleasure yeah. and we appreciate you coming to Texas and talking to us and enlightening our, uh, our folks about the latest and greatest. But thank you so much. Thank you very much for having me. Always a pleasure. Mm -hmm.